Good morning. Welcome to Ramsey Baptist Church and our online service. Uh, today we have Daniel Howson preaching for us. Uh, but now, as we begin, let's just read a, a few words of scripture just to guide our hearts and our minds towards our Lord and God. And I'm reading Psalm 34, verses 1 to 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Indeed, that's what we're doing now. We are exalting the name of the Lord together. And now we'll pray and ask him for his help in doing that. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, help us this morning to bless your name. Help us to praise you. Help us to boast in your grace, in your compassion, in your power. And Lord, may we be exalting your name together. We thank you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit is in and with your people and that social distancing is no barrier to him and the fellowship that he can provide. So Lord, may we know this oneness in our hearts and our minds as we exalt your name together today. Amen. Well, we are going to continue to exalt the name of Almighty God together as we sing our first hymn today. What gift of grace, or you may know it better as, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's sing.
Jesus Christ wrote seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. They are letters that come to us in the Bible today. Letters that address our church in Ramsey. Letters that actually we get to write our own response to. Will we have ears to hear what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say to us today? The third church that Jesus Christ wrote to is the Church of Pergamos. Like Ephesus and Smyrna, it was hard to be a Christian in Pergamos. The persecution was severe. Christians were already dying for their faith in Pergamos. And whilst this church is praised by Jesus Christ for its perseverance in the face of such difficulty, this is a church that, generally speaking, is faithful. It is not a church where everything is well, though. There is a cancer in this church that needs cutting out before it kills the church. They've allowed false doctrine to creep in. This is a church which is compromising its doctrine and its morality. Join me on Tuesday evening as we look at Pergamos, the compromised church, and as we consider what Jesus Christ is saying to us in Ramsey Baptist Church through this letter that he wrote nearly 2,000 years ago. Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 to 12 In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, and were baptised by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Well, may God bless his word to you that we've read together this morning. Hello, hello, I'm going to sing a song for you today and it's a song all about getting to heaven and it's about how we can and how we can't get to heaven and the things that tell us that we can't get to heaven, you can't catch a plane, you can't get a spaceship, you can't take a hovercraft, you can't take a helicopter and not even the fastest racing car, there's only one way and that one way is to know Jesus. And we're going to sing it now. And I'm going to sing it through once. And then and I'm going to ask two of my friends, not just one, but two of my friends, to come and do the actions. So you can copy those as well. So here we go. You can't catch a plane to take you to heaven. Not even a spaceship can get that far. You can't take a hovercraft or helicopter journey or drive in the fastest racing car. Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus is the way. Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus is the way. Well, hello. Are you ready? And hello. Are you ready? Shall we go then? Here we go. You can't catch a plane to take you to heaven. Not even a spaceship can get that far. 
You can't take a hovercraft or helicopter journey Or drive in the fastest racing car Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus is the way Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus is the way Should we do that once more? You can't catch a plane to take you to heaven Not even a spaceship can get that far You can't take a hovercraft or helicopter journey Or drive in the fastest racing car Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus is the way Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus is the way Well, thanks very much. Thank you, and thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed that song today. Bye for now. Well, good morning, folks of Ramsey. It's nice to be with you this morning, even though it's digitally or virtually. Um, I want to bring to you God's Word this morning from the, from the Bible, and uh, trust it'll be a blessing to you and a challenge to you. But before we do anything, Let's just bow our heads and let's pray together and let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we turn to your word this morning and we pray that it'll become real to our hearts, it'll become relevant to our lives and that you would change us through reading and studying your word this morning, that we would be better people, that we would be better fitted to reach the lost, that you would help us to understand our own need of trusting in you and repenting of our sin. So help us, Lord, this morning, every one of us, those who are listening from the church and those who are listening uh, from outside the church that never go into a church. We pray, Lord, that these words this morning from your word, the Bible, would become real to us all. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I want to bring to you this morning just one particular word from the Bible, and that word is repentance. It's used uh, around a hundred times in the Bible, so it's a very, very important Bible word, repentance. And I want to simply explain to you what it means. What does the Bible uh, mean when it talks about uh, repenting? Um, uh, re the word repentance actually means turning. It's, a, it's an about turn. It's, it's a facing one direction, turning around and facing another direction or going in one direction, turning and going in an opposite direction. That's the literal uh, meaning of the word translate, uh, translated. Um, but in a, in a Bible sense, the word repentance really means turning from sin and turning to Jesus. So there's the two aspects of repentance and faith. These two are the, the, the two sides of the same coin, repentance and faith. So there's a, a turning from our sin, turning from our old life, turning from the life that we used to live, our old, old attitudes, our old doings, and turning to Jesus and trusting in him, trusting in Jesus. The word trust is very important, as we'll see um, a, little, a little bit late, later on. Repentance is a change of mind. But it's, no, it's more than a change of mind. It's a change of mind that results in a change of action. So it's a change of mind that leads to action. So repentance isn't just something passive. It's an active word. It's a word that we do something about. It's not just a word that we, we agree with, as we see, uh, as we see later, but it's a word that actually leads us to doing something about it. So it's a very, it's a very strong word. It's a very active word. It's a, it's turning, it's marching in one direction, turning around, facing the other di direction and turning uh, and, and walking in the other direction, marching in the other direction. Um, somebody described re re uh, re repentance as being sorry enough to quit. So being sorry enough for our old life, our sinful life, to stop doing it, to, to trust in Jesus, and to turn away from our sin, these, these two aspects. Um, the, the word contrite comes to mind, or contrition. So it's being really deeply sorry for, for our actions, for the way we are, for our sinful natures. 
um, and, and wanting rid of that, wanting that uh, blotted out, uh, wanting the old life to be completely gone, to, to hate sin and to wish it wasn't there. That's the, the basic meaning of, of, um, of repentance. It's, it's don't do it again. Let me give you an illustration. Say I go to Peter and Valerie's house late one night and, and pick up a brick and throw it through their window. They've, they've annoyed me somehow. And, and, uh, and Peter and Valerie are sitting in their house and all of a sudden this brick comes through the window. They don't know who's, who's thrown it through. And I run away and nobody knows about it. But that night I feel really bad about it. I thought, oh, I shouldn't really have done that. That was a bit harsh. And, you know, so I, the next day I go down and I, I knock on Peter's door and I said, look, Peter, it was, it was me through that brick through your window and, and I'm really sorry about it. Will you, will you forgive me? And Peter, being the sort of fellow I know he is, we would, he would say, well, Danny, you know, it hurt us and so on, but, but I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you. A couple of days later, what Peter did to me really gets it up under my skin again. And, and I start seething about it. So I pick up another brick just after he's fixed the window and I throw another brick through the window. And then you know the story that late that night, can't sleep, feel bad. Next day, knock on his door. Now, how long? Are Peter and Valerie going to put up with that? You see, repentance is not doing it again. Repentance is saying, Peter, I'm really sorry. I repent of that sin. In other words, I'm not going to do it again. You can rest assured I've learned my lesson and I'm not doing it again. Now, Peter, if somebody does break your window, it wasn't me. OK, so uh, that's the basic meaning of, of the word repentance that we're going to look at today in, in a biblical sense. Now, I want to give you a few Bible readings. So these are just odd verses about repentance that I've picked out of, of the Bible to try and show you uh, from the Bible what repentance really is. The first one is Matthew 3, verse 2. And actually, it's Matthew 4, verse 17. It's repeated. Repent, Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. OK, uh, Matthew 3, verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Matthew 4, verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethesda, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Zid Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Repent and believe the gospel. Luke 13, verse 5. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. They're very strong words. Luke 24, verse 47. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then Acts 2, 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent then and turn to God, so that your sin may be wiped out or blotted out. Acts 17, verse 30. God now command, commands all people everywhere to repent. Did you get that? God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. So God is kind and leads us to repentance. 1 Corinthians 7 verse, verse 9, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. And then 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, those are just a few verses picked out of the Bible to give you a basic understanding of what the Bible is teaching us 
uh, about repentance. Now, I've got four, four points for you. No, point number one, intellectual understanding alone is not repentance. OK, intellectual understanding alone is not repentance. Repentance is more than mere knowledge. It's not just knowing about God, knowing about Jesus in your head. OK, so we need to have some knowledge of, of who Christ is and what he has done to be saved, to, re, to be able to repent. But we need more than just head knowledge. Um, the Bible says, how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard in Romans chapter 10? So people who've never heard the gospel can't repent, can they? People who don't know they need to repent don't know how to repent. They don't know what even what the word means. So we need to have the knowledge, some knowledge of the Bible, some knowledge of, of who Christ is and what Christ has done on the cross for us to be able to, to repent of our sin. But knowing the facts about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection is not enough. Now, if you go to church regularly and you know about Jesus and you know about the cross, that doesn't mean that you have repented of your sin. That doesn't mean you are saved, you're born again, you know Jesus. Repentance is a definite act. OK, we'll see that in a minute. Um, Romans chapter one says this, though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve of those who practice them. So these are people who know how they should live, but they refuse to do it. They know they need to repent, but they refuse to do it. And they tell others they don't need to do it as well. So they go along with, with, with others. Um, the Bible says the devil believes. The devil knows all about Jesus. He knows all about the cross. He knows all about the resurrection. He knows all the Bible from cover to cover and he quotes it, misquotes it sometimes. The devil believes. In fact, the book of James tells us, you believe that God is one, you do well. It's good. You believe God is one. Even the demons believe and shudder at the fact that God is one. So the, the, it's more than an intellectual uh, belief. It's an, an intellectual understanding. So intellectual understanding alone is not repentance. Second point. Emotional agreement alone is not repentance. So you might you might know it all and you might agree with it all. But that's not repentance. Knowing the facts and agreeing with them is not enough. Admitting and recognizing truth is good. But that is not repentance. Sorry to tell you, it's not repentance. There's a there's a step further as we'll see in a minute. See, John chapter three, Jesus meets a very religious man. His name's Nicodemus. And Nicodemus has weighed up the facts about Jesus. He's looked at his teaching. He's looked at his remarkable miracles. And he's come to the conclusion, Jesus, you are a teacher come from God. And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, that's true. That's right. But you need to be born again. You need to repent. That's really what Jesus is saying. You've got it all up here, Nicodemus. You've watched me. You know all about me. You know I'm the one sent from God, but you need to take it one step further. You need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin and you need to trust in me, Nicodemus. That's really what Jesus was saying. He still had to put his trust in Jesus. Um, Acts 26, you have King Agrippa, who believed the scriptures. He admits it. I believe the scriptures, but he also admitted he wasn't a Christian. So you can know all about Jesus. You can know all about the Bible. You can know all the Bible stories. Perhaps some of you've been to Sunday school all your lives and you've grown up in the church. Your parents took you and, and you, you, you know it back to front. You know all the stories and you agree with them. Emotionally, you go along with them and you would argue that the Bible's true and you would argue for Jesus. But You've never actually repented. Wow. Wow. Intellectual understanding and emotional agreement 
they bring you to being interested, but being interested as a bystander. So you're sitting on the stands watching the game. You're not playing the game. Repentance is getting involved. Repentance is playing the game, not just as a bystander, not just agreeing with it all, going along with all the rules, but it's actually getting involved. It's actually repenting. It's actually turning from your sin as an act in a moment of time and turning to Jesus at the same time. So um, intellectual understanding is, is, not, is not repentance. Emotional agreement alone is not repentance. But thirdly, making a personal decision to turn from sin and to turn to Jesus, to trust Jesus, is repentance. So I've told you two things it's not. Now I'm going to tell you what it actually is. How does it actually work? So it's not just belief in facts about Jesus. It's trust and belief in Jesus. OK, now those, those two words, um, belief and faith, that both Bible words, both very strong words used a lot in the Bible. But unfortunately, today have a sort of a, a different context, a different meaning, nearly to when when the Bible was was um, was put together. Uh, belief is in the Bible sense, belief is, is trust. And this, this, the word trust is the one I prefer. Um, you see, you can believe in anything, can't you? Um, you can believe something is true without any personal commitment to it. Um, you can believe that Paris is the capital of France. No, no commitment to that at all. It's just a truth. It's a fact. You can believe it's true. And if you didn't believe it's true, you'd be a bit mad, wouldn't you? Because because Paris is the capital of France. So you believe it, but there's no trust there, is there? Um, you can believe that six times six equals 36 and you'd be right. It's a fact, you believe it, but there's no emotional, personal commitment to that. But when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to faith, when it comes to the word repentance, there is a, an, a personal commitment to it. It's more than just belief. It's belief with trust. It's a leaning on the facts. It's a, it's a be believing in the facts that makes a difference. Um, so, um, that's, so that's belief. Let's look at faith for a minute. Now, faith is a word, you know, people say to me, oh, I wish I had your faith, you know, because they see me as a Christian and talk to, talk to them about Jesus and stuff. And they say, well, you know, I wish I had your faith. Well, how do I how do I get that faith? And and to them, that faith is something abstract. So you just have faith. Um, but actually, faith is far more than that in the biblical sense. Faith is, again, like belief, it's trusting it's a, it's a leaning on something. Faith has to have an object. So if you get a chair and you say, I, I believe, I trust this chair, I have faith that this chair can hold my weight, then you can, um, you can put your trust in that chair and you can sit on that chair, which is fine. But if I was to say, now I believe there's a chair here and there's no chair there, and I believe I can sit on this chair and it'll hold my weight. And I try to sit on it. I'd end up on the floor because my faith is, is in something that's not there. You see, so faith has to have an object and the object of our faith is Jesus. And Jesus really is there and we can really trust him. So it's a trust in Jesus. This, this faith. Now, um, here's a quotation. It's an, uh, faith is sometimes used to refer to an almost irrational commitment to something in spite of strong evidence to the contrary. Now you can turn YouTube off and we'll rewind it and wind that back a few times to get that into your head. I'll say it again. So it's sometimes used to refer to an almost irrational commitment to something in spite of strong evidence to the contrary. To believe something that we're quite sure is not true. That, that's what faith is today. You talk out on the streets to people about faith, that's what they come up with. 
Um, here's one look. Leicester City Football Club. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Um, just a T-shirt. Here's what somebody said ab about that. Without belief, you will never achieve the unbelievable. What a load of nonsense. Without belief, you will never achieve the unbelievable. You see, faith or repentance is taking God at his word. It's putting our trust in Jesus, a real person who really lived, who really died, who really rose again. It's not just faith, a step and leap in the dark. No, it's far more than that. It's putting our trust in the in an object, if you like, in a person, in Jesus Christ himself. Um, so repentance is making a personal decision to trust Jesus. It's not just having it here. Isn't it's not just having it here. It's a personal decision to trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. Um, listen, repentance is not, I repeat, is not a gift from God. God doesn't hand you repentance. Repentance is something you have to do. Something, it, it, it's you turning from your sin and trusting in Jesus. And more than that, repentance is not just not a gift from God, but it's a command by God. Why, we read it, didn't we? God has commended all people everywhere to repent. He's commanded it. And without repentance, we're lost. We're in our sin. God cannot do our repenting for us. And it's, a, it's an act of our own free will. It's our responsibility to, to, to repent. Now, his goodness, as we read earlier on, his goodness leads us to repentance. But we do the repenting. So, so Jesus leads us to repentance. He makes everything possible for us. He explains it to us. The Bible is clear about it. We've got no excuse. It's a command. So, you know, if there's a command there, there must be uh, like conditions attached to it. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. And if we repent, if we turn from our sin and we turn to Christ, we will be saved. We will be born again. We'll be converted. We'll know Jesus personally in our own lives. And then here's another thing about repentance. It is morally impossible for one person to repent for another. I can't repent for you and you can't repent for me. Your pastor can't repent for you. You have to repent. This is a personal decision to repent. We must, as an act of our own free will, repent and trust in Jesus. See, we're responsible for our own sin. That, that's obvious. If we sin, if I throw a brick through Peter and Valerie's window, it's me that's done it. No point in blaming them because it's them that's done something against me and they owe it, you know, they deserve it and all that. No, if I throw a brick through their window, it's me that's done it and I am morally responsible for that act. I've done it. And unless I repent of it, then that act still stands. I'm morally responsible for my sin. Every single sin I've committed is my fault. I'm to blame for it. That's quite something. Um, we need to take responsibility for that and full responsibility for that. And when we repent of it, we stop doing it. So if I tell a lie, I sin, I'm responsible for that sin. But if I repent of that lie or repent of lying, then I don't lie again. And if I do lie, I go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm really sorry. I've done it again. I've sinned. I repent of it. I turn from it. We'll see. We'll see how that works. In, in a minute. So repentance, to sum it up, is our own personal obligation. It's not going to land in our lap one day. We're not going to wake up one morning having repented in our sleep. It's not going to happen. It's not going to just fall onto us one day. It's not just going to happen that we've, we, just, we just happen to be repent. We happen to have repented. 
No, repentance is an act of your own free will. You must do it. Um, going back to Nicodemus, Jesus, Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must repent. You must be born again. Turn from your sin and trust in Jesus, the two, the two aspects. Now, Jesus has made this gloriously achievable from our point of view. We can repent. It's not something that we have to go through a whole pile of rituals. It's not something that we have to do, you know, say all those are Hail Marys or go to church so many times or go to a confession box or you read our Bibles loads or go to church even. Though going to church is a good thing. Being baptised as a believer is a good thing. But that's not repentance. Repentance is, the, is an act of faith, an act of trust. We trust in Jesus and we turn away from our sin. And Jesus has made that possible because he died on the cross. Jesus has made our, our repentance gloriously possible because Jesus took our sin on the cross. When Jesus died, he died in our place. So when we repent, our sin all our sin and even our sinful attitudes and, 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 and actions are all put upon Jesus. And Jesus dies for that sin on the cross. And I am freed from that sin. That sin is no longer condemns me. I remember it. I'll know it's there. I'll know it's still there. But it's, but it's on Jesus. It's been paid for. The debt has been paid for by Jesus on the cross. That, that's the gospel. Repent and turn to Jesus and know him. Um, now, fourthly, okay, repentance and trust continue throughout life. The Christian life begins with repentance. Unless you have repented, you're still in your sin. You're still lost. Okay, get that, that's true. I know it's difficult to get that, that but that's the Bible truth. Unless you've repented, you're still in your sin, you're still lost. I initial repentance and trust occur only once in our life. We don't have to keep, keep going back to Jesus and say, oh, I'm sorry for my sin today, Lord, and, you know, please forgive me and I repent again. No, there's an initial repentance, a once for all repentance where we trust in Jesus. Our sins are taken onto the cross in his body. He dies for those sins and those sins are finished. They've gone even though perhaps we still remember them. They've gone. They, they'll they never be held against us anymore. The Bible says that as far as the east is from the west, they're thrown into the deepest depths of the deepest sea. They're completely gone. That's, that's amazing. Every single one of them is completely gone. That's initial repentance when we repent of our sin. But, let me say this, each day, each moment of the day, there has to be a heartfelt repentance for sins that we have committed because we're not perfect. And to, listen, none of us are. We, we still sin. We still fall. We're living in a fallen world. We're living in a, in a, in a, in a generation which is just f full of sin. Just sin all around us, immorality and, and waywardness. It's all around us everywhere. And because we live in that society, because we live in that world, we tend to fall. And when we fall, we go back to the Lord, say, Lord, I, I remind you of my repentance and I'm sorry for what I've done. Um, in some of the Eastern European countries, when they've been opened up from, from communism, the Christians were called the repenters because they were continually repenting. Um, they, they had like short accounts with God. Um, Revelation 3 and 19 says this about Christians. Those whom I love, I rebuke, and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So there's a there's an initial repentance when we come to know the Lord Jesus as our own personal saviour, when we become proper Christians, true Christians, when we become born again, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and our sins are taken away, we become saved. But then there's an ongoing daily, moment by moment, walking with Jesus, repenting of our sin, continually, earnest and repent. Your daily repentance 
and trust in Jesus are proof of your initial repentance. Did you get that? Your daily repentance and trust in Jesus are proof of your initial repentance. Listen, if you continue to habitually sin, now habitually, you have a habit of it, you probably haven't repented. Think about that one. That's really, really important. Think about that one. If, if, you, if you can sin and not feel any sense of guilt, any sense of um, feeling bad about it, or contrition, as we talked about before, probably a sign you've never repented. Because when you repent, you become sensitive to sin. And then when you sin, you feel bad and you go to the Lord. And you go to him in contrition. Lord, I'm sorry. So let's have a little recap. Intellectual understanding alone is not repentance. It's not just what's up here. Emotional agreement alone is not repentance, not just what's down here. Making a personal decision to turn away from sin and trust Jesus is repentance. And then fourthly, repentance and trust continue throughout life. Did you get those four points? Let me ask you a question in closing. Have you repented? Have you turned from your sin? Are you trusting in Jesus? Are you trusting in Jesus? Um, the consequences of being unrepentant are horrible. Listen, folks, the consequences of unrepentance are horrible. Hell is at stake. Don't just shrug your shoulders and say, oh, I'll do it another time. Don't just shrug your shoulders and say, I don't care. Listen, this is really, really important. Probably one of the most important words in the Bible. Repent. And believe the gospel. Trust in Jesus. How do you do it? Pray. Talk to Jesus. Talk to the Lord. You don't have to say a big long prayer. You don't have to go through all the, you know, all the stuff. Just say, Lord, here I am. I want to trust you. I want to repent. I want to turn from my sin. I want to trust you. Please help me. Give me the courage to live for you. And then go on. Move on from there. Repent and believe the gospel. Trust that's a help to you. And more than anything, I trust that each one of you that's listening to my voice this morning will either have repented or will repent. Thank you. Have a good Sunday. Well, thank you for that, Daniel. We're now going to sing our closing hymn this morning, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say.
thank you for uh, joining with us this morning. Now let's just close our time with a word of prayer. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.